Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and yes, we have a brand new release of Godot. Godot Engine 4.5 is here, the wait is over, well I guess we can now start waiting for Godot 4.6, but 4.5 is here, it is ready, no longer in beta, so today we're going to jump in, check out what is new there, we're going to hands on a couple of features, I'm not going to go into too much depth for two reasons, first off, Godot really upped their uh, release notes games, as you will see in just a minute, and then on top of that, I actually already did a video on the top six new features, Features, in my humble opinion, in Godot 4.5, I recommend checking that one out for more hands-on. But what you see here, this is Godot 4.5, and you may notice I am using my Mac today. And there's a good reason behind that. One of the major new features is um, kind of an implementation on Mac, so we're going to start there. This is a demo environment, by the way, available in an ongoing bundle. I will have the links down below. There's also a couple of uh, relevant Humble bundles, including one of uh, Godot 4 training materials, if you're interested, will also be linked down below. So check that one out later on. I will also have that link to that uh, uh, six best features in the article down below. So there's lots of stuff down below, but okay, back to this release. So what is this new special Mac feature? Well, there's the game window that was added in Godot... 4.4, four, I think, maybe? It, it might be earlier than that. Um, and this one, it basically allows you to preview your game running, like you could in the world of Unity for years. Now, it actually works on Mac. So now the embed window, they completely rewrote how this works. And the way they rewrote this actually is a superior way than the, this was implemented before. So it's also going to be... Um, ported over to the Windows platforms as well. The, this implementation for embedding the run window. By the way, you do have options of how it embeds up here. So if you want to have that window float, if you're using multiple monitors or whatever, you can turn that on right there. Another new thing with this uh, uh, embedded game window here is they added the ability to mute. So if you have some sound effects going and you're, you're you know, interacting with your scene, you want to see how things work, you can now mute it so that you can keep your sanity. Now, the cool thing about the game window here is you can actually now also, with Godot 4.5, multi-select objects in the world. So I can go here, I can click that guy, and then I click that guy. And also, since they are the same type, all of the, the things that they match up on, so all of the, the nodes that they share in common, well, you can manipulate them. And that's pretty cool. So here you can see, well, these are the exact same objects, so it's going to work quite well. But here, I'm going to go ahead, we'll link to the scale, and then we'll scale them on the x-axis, and then boom, there you see. So you can use this game mode to, like, make tweaks and play with how your game works. Now, the thing here is, when you click stop, it will actually uh, revert it. So we go back over here, you're going to notice uh, they're back to normal size. So uh, I do wish that there was a way of, like, a button that says, persist the changes I made. That would be really cool. Another thing we've got going on in this particular release is the support for stencils, which is going to enable a lot of options. There's some cool special effects they show in the README, uh, but I'll, I'll show you right here. So you can see here, we're going to go to the surface material override for this surface on this on this chandelier over here. So let's just focus that guy in like so. So this guy right here, if I scroll on down to the bottom, you're going to notice there's a stencil category now, and there's a bunch of neat options. So you've got X-Ray, uh, which is available right here. Uh, so that is there, but the cool one I like is Outline. And what I could do with Outline, you see, let me switch this to red, it becomes much more noticeable. So there you can see, and you can change the thickness of the outline over there. This is what you could use to do things like um, selection masks in real-time character games, you know, or RPGs where you've got your character selected, you outline them and so on. Stencil buffers can be used to do that, which is very neat. So uh, that is another nice feature. There, there is much more to this one, and then my favorite new feature, to be honest, is these little check boxes. So you're going to notice with the check boxes. See this one? It's because I'm using ambient occlusion on this particular object. If I was wasn't, I just click it, and then what you'll notice, and for some reason on Mac, it is very, very slow. It always causes that, but there, it like, boom, it hides the item that you're working with. Same thing here, if I was working with refraction, I go ahead and click it, and then again, for some reason on Mac, it, it is actually a slower person. On Windows, it's instant. But it, if you're not using an object, it, it hides it from you. This is a great UI organization tool, in my humble opinion. So those are a couple of the features of the uh, release uh, hands-on. But again, check out my six favorite feature video. I'll go into more depth with some of the other options here. But instead, what we're going to do is check out the release notes. Now, they've done a really good job on these. So uh, they make my life a whole lot easier of describing what is in this 4.5 release. So we've got a number of things. By the way, this is available major platform, so it's Windows, Mac, Linux, also on Android as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so here, stencil buffer. So you saw stencil buffer can be used to do like a, a simple outline, but here you can see a, a more advanced use of stencil buffers right there. 
So uh, they're going to open up a whole lot of options uh, for graphics. Stencil buffers are probably the big new features, probably why it's the highlighted feature as well. Another one here is they implemented Access Kit. And on, out of that, they've got the ability to have screen readers. So if you have a vision impairment or a learning disability or whatever, you can use the screen reader and it will understand the Godot user interface. So it makes uh, the Godot process more accessible to more people. We also have script backtracing and custom loggers. So you can see here, uh, it's basically a call stack that's available. Uh, you can print this out. You can even do this, and the key thing here is you can do this in release builds. So you can use the script backtracer to hunt down crashes when, that aren't necessarily on your computer. So you, you can have custom logging there, and it will show a call stack of you know this function called this function called this function called this function that crashed. Uh, and that can be invaluable for um, debugging issues, reporting issues. And again, you can do this in the release version without the performance hit. So you can have your users send you logs or your beta testers send you logs, but still run with the full strength version. So very powerful feature there. Another big one here is Shader Baker. And I actually just did a video yesterday on performance issues with Unreal Engine. And shader compilation issues are definitely one of them. Hiccups when your shaders load, big, big issue in games generally. And the reason for this is shaders need to be compiled for the hardware they're run on. And in the, especially in the world of Windows, there are so many different APIs and device, device drivers and hardware capabilities and so on. And quite frankly, a shader is a small bit of code until you compile it into a a binary version, and all of a sudden it goes from taking up bytes to taking up megabytes. So that's why shaders are pre-compiled. Well, now you actually have the option of baking your shaders. So if you don't have a kajillion shaders, so if you have a kajillion shaders, you're still going to need to compile them at runtime because your users aren't going to want you to use up their complete hard drive. But if you've got, say, 100 shaders or 200 shaders and you could trade disk space for performance, that's where the shader baker comes in. And what does the shader baker give you? Well, on Apple and Windows devices using Metal and Direct3D12, they saw a 20 times decrease in load times for the third person um, shooter demo. So you get significantly faster uh, startup times here. Uh, we also have this internationalization preview. So if you are working with, again, you see different fonts, uh, right to left layout fonts and so on, you can preview them live in the editor, makes your internationalization efforts a lot easier. So you saw there, they just switch between the different options and then it basically it will immediately update. So definitely going to make that kind of process easier easier. Now this one is featured in my top six feature video. Uh, it is now they chunk physics together uh, for tile map. So it used to be in a tile. So each one of these is a tile. It used to have a shape around it. So now what you've got is the ability to do these compounded ones. And what it's done is it'll create a handful of polygons. So here you can see it's about eight polygons instead of, you know, 200. So it's going to make your uh, physics collision detection so much faster. And it automatically takes care of making the smallest shape that will um, confine or, or will contain your tile maps uh, automatically for you. So uh, this is a huge speed benefit if you're using tile maps and physics together. Um, and then we've got some just core level stuff. So new uh, duplicate deep method for these classes gives user full control over what gets duplicated or not. Um, they also have uh, project customized engine build setting changes. So 4.5 expands on what is detected. Not only does it detect classes, but it can now set correct build options. It also takes into account which classes are used by the project's GD extensions. And then on the editor side of things, as I mentioned earlier on, in the game window, you can now mute it. And even better, this now works on Mac, which if you're using a Mac, you will appreciate. On top of that, if you drag a resource in, it will automatically pop the UID out into the code. So you can see right there, if you want to use things by UID, a UID is now generated for every single asset in the Godot game engine. So it is a good and useful way of uniquely identifying assets. Uh, you, you can uh, select multiple remote nodes at runtime. I demonstrated that in the game editor earlier when I changed the size of those different chandeliers. Uh, you can also change the language of your editor on demand. So if if you're, um, this is a little niche because you're not going to be changing your editing language that often. This is like the, the language that the editor itself, like Godot's UI is rendered in. But if you do that, you no longer need to restart it. Uh, this is nice from the GD script side of things. You can now export variables as variants. You can expose them to the inspector window that way. Uh, and then the person using it can automatically pick which type they want. So you can hear you select from the various different options that are available. So it gives you the ability to expose um, something out to the editor where it, what it is isn't necessarily that well defined. This also is potentially incredibly abusable. So do keep in mind, if you're using this, you should think, should this be a variant? 
because if you're going to expose it, you should probably define what it is. But if you can't define what it is ahead of time, you now have the ability to export out variants. Um, and then again, toggleable inspector sections. This is lovely. I absolutely love this. It makes the UI so much cleaner. And then again, for some reason on Mac, it is sluggishly slow. It is not like that on Windows, so I don't know what's going on there. There is now also, if you're using a color value inside of your GD script, you click on the color, a little square beside it, and you can actually manually pick it from a color picker option. Um, execute editor scripts using the command palette. So any named editor script files in your project now appear in the command palette, making it much easier to execute specific project scripts. Uh, paste as unique option when copying and then pasting a resource in an editor slot. You usually paste a reference to the copy. If you want a uh, unique copy instead, you had to manually click on make unique. Now with the paste as unique option, you do not need to do that. Uh, duplicate projects straight from the project manager. So there is now a duplicate button. So if you're using a template and you're kind of spawning from it, you can do it that way. Uh, append signal source automatically as checkbox is now available over there. Animation player got a number of different improvements as well. Uh, you can see them all listed right there. New icons, sharper. So there is the before and after. So you can see the results. It's, uh, you know, you can see it mostly on that one, the lattice down there. See how much sharper it is uh, in the after effect. So, uh, and they're DPI aware. So if you're using a high DPI display, your icons should look better. I believe that's also ultimately because they switched over to SVG, uh, but I don't want to be quoted on that one. Uh, cascade content easily with a foldable container. This one I love. This was featured in my six new features as well. Uh, you can now set on your labels, uh, stacked effects being outlines and shadows. So if you have drop shadows, you want to have multiple, or you have outlines and you want to have multiple, or if you want to have outlines and drop shadows combined, uh, they are now these easy done in side of stacked effects. So you can see the effect of uh, this one has an outline and a red drop shadow applied to it. Um, and then uh, recursive overrides are now available. So it's now possible to change mouse and focus behavior of a control node recursively. Greatly helps create uh, complex GUIs without breaking a sweat. Uh, added the required qualifier. When extended, some classes need some virtual methods to be overridden in order to work, but it wasn't always obvious in the documentation. Uh, so now they have required qualifier, which will come after the virtual where applicable. Um, and then platforms, a number of changes there. So on Android, editor UI adapted for non-desktop users. So there are new, uh, this touch actions panel will pop up. It makes the, it basically, if you're using uh, Godot using a touch screen, uh, better user interface support now there as well. Uh, supports for uh, 16 kilobyte pages, edge to edge support and camera feed support on Android as well. Uh, Linux, native Wayland. So if you've been waiting for Wayland, sub-window support is now there for Wayland. On Apple, big one again, I mentioned earlier on, is the embedded support is now added to uh, Mac OS as well. And if you are one of the three people that bought a Vision OS device, hey, you can export out to it now. So your $35 AR headset, hey, might have a use now. Um, RC Edit is no longer needed, so you can modify uh, metadata on the Windows. This is Windows only. Uh, you should need to use a program called RC Edit to change that. Now you can do it without. Um, and then if you're using the web, a big one here is they enabled, and I think this was a really small change with a really profound result, is they enabled WebAssembly SIMD. So single, single instruction, multiple, oh, oh, it's right here. <laughs> single instruction, multiple data. Uh, basically, it's, it's uh, an optimization technique on chips normally. Um, the technology that permits CPUs to do parallel computation, often speeding up the program as a whole. Starting with 4.5, you can expect your web games to run a bit more smoothly. Basically, they turn this on. You don't need to do anything. It should just make web games run faster because they added SIM to support uh, on the scripting side of things. Uh, you can now load .NET directly from Android APKs, GD Script. Uh, variadic arguments are now available. So if you want, so you can see variadic arguments is basically uh, a function that can take multiple uh, undefined it's normally called var args but you can see here it's got one parameter or, th or three parameters or five parameters uh you now have the support for it here and you can see how it's implemented with this dot 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 uh and basically it's an array of parameters that can be passed in uh abstract classes and methods so you can now declare gd script classes to be abstract declaring an abstract means that the class is not meant to be instantiated directly basically it's normally a way of defining interfaces uh, so again, animal, but you can't implement animal. So you'd have to implement it as cat or dog. 
Um, it was available internally before. They've made it available for everyone now, basically. Uh, GD extensions uh, sometimes need to run code at engine-specific queues. For example, there were a lot of issues accessing the engine singletons from GD extensions, so there was no simple way to know when the engine had started up or shut down. From now on, developers are able to register main loop callbacks directly from GD extensions, such as startup and shutdown. So you know where you are in the life cycle of the system. Should make extension writing easier. Uh, a number of improvements to the animation system, so you can bind bones to other bones using the Bone Constraint 3D node. Uh, on the import side, so they reintroduced batch editing of assets. So if you've got a bunch of things that you want to re-import and change at the same time, you can now do so. Uh, and they use the SDL3 game input driver. I don't know what you're ultimately going to benefit from that, but you should get better control su controller support as well. There is now a dedicated 2D nav server. Before, it used to use nav 3D just for 2D. Now, nav 2D has its own dedicated navigation server. This is what you use for doing like pathfinding calculations, etc., in 2D and 3D games. Um, process navigation regions asynchronously. Uh, so the main thread of a computer programming is like a project leader. If the project leader uh, handles too many tasks and doesn't delegate enough, it can affect the overall performance of the team, enabling in uh, async iterations as the navigation servers to delegate the navigation process to a background thread, which can improve overall navigation performance. So it's an optimization technique to make advantage of like multiple um, multiple cores, etc., on uh, for your navigation connections. Uh, physics. So uh, scene three D. Uh, Scene tree 3D physics now has interpolation in there. Interpolation is basically smoothing out between two keyframes. Uh, so you should just get nicer, smoother uh, physics as a result. Uh, in terms of rendering, uh, they added uh, specular occlusion from ambient light options. You turn this on as a project level tally. So it's, it's pretty hard to see, but where you can really see it. So here you see forward with, so without, with. So without, with. And where I want you to look is like right there you can see it sort of on the so it, it's giving you secondary light bounces and you can so you see the shadowing on the side so look at the side of this tub thing and then there and as you move across you see a little bit on this wall too so you may like the result you may not uh, but you can turn it on at a project level um, you also have the ability to have bent normals. So it's a normal map uh, with more detail. This is built into your, uh, on the content level. So this is something you build, uh, your, normal mech, your normal mesh can have additional information encoded in it. And here you can see the results. So without, with. So again, look down here. So that's built into the normal map. More details available there as well. Again, you have to author this in your normal tool. This isn't something that just turning it on does something. It, it is something that is an asset level driven thing. Um, SMAA or subpixel morphological anti-aliasing um, is now uh, available in one X support. So a modern post-processing based anti-aliasing solution, get rid of those pesky jaggies, provides sharper anti-aliasing than FXAA at the trade-off of being more resource intensive. So if you want to have slightly better anti-aliasing and you're willing to give up some performance to get it, SMAA 1X has just been added. Um, and then mobile render now uses half precision floating point for format. Uh, what did that actually say? Uh, format explicitly. Uh, and then in the world of AR and XR, uh, foveated rendering on Vulkan is available. Uh, and then uh, support for Direct 3D 12 Open XR back end is there as well. And yeah, uh, we got a couple other improvements there. And that is more or less it. So that is Godot 4.5. Five. If you want to go ahead and check that one out, I would highly recommend it. By the way, I do have that video where I cover my six favorite features in there, which are the inspector collapsing, game window, the, the improvements that we saw generally, the shader baker, various different improvements to GD script, stackable shadows and borders, and then the physics on tile map layers. Uh, and then again, I mentioned earlier on, there is a training bundle available over on Humble. So if you were just picking up Godot 4.x and you're a little overwhelmed about where to start, this is a very comprehensive um course from Zenva. Uh, each one of these comes with like a, like a 50 to 100 page PDF for each course as well. Could be a good way to learn Godot 4. Everything here is Godot 4 or higher, uh, which is pretty current, which is quite nice. Uh, if you use my link, it does help support me, by the way, and I very much appreciate that. We also have this one. Uh, this is much uh, smaller for Godot. It's the Game Dev Assets and Tools Bundle. What you'll notice here is a handful of the assets, such as this one right here, are available for Godot as well, but not many. There's only like four or five Godot ones. But if you're looking to pick up some environments, there are some Godot 
Joe ones included in this bundle as well. And then this one, the Star Nova bundle is still going on. Do not pay this price. Use the code SN40. It makes it like 10 bucks. Uh, so if you want the environment that we were looking at here, the cathedral environment is right there, but there's also some other ones here as well. So ladies and gentlemen, that is Godot 4.5. What do you think of this release? Let me know in the comments down below. I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.